1 Corinthians 7.25. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who is by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he's engaged to, and if she is getting along in years, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. The Lord's word. Well, we're going to finish what we started last week. You'll be pleased to know this section is shorter, so we won't need to spend as much time as we did last week on it. Um, If you weren't here last week, can I encourage you to avail yourself of the sermon, because in a sense, this is part two of part one. Um, so if you've missed part one, you've missed a whole section of what I think would be helpful. Let's pray. Our Father, it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that we approach you, and it is by the power of the Spirit that we do so. You are our Father, and Christ is our mediator, and the Spirit is the one who assists us and helps us to pray in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your greatness. We thank you for the way in which you have made yourself known. We thank you for the wonderful intimacy we can enjoy with you. We thank you for creating us, making us, bringing us into this world. And we thank you for the relationships that we can enjoy with each other. As we again just wrestle with your word, you know every person who is here. You know those who are married. You know the singles. You know those who would love to be married. You know those who don't want to be married. And you know those perhaps who are married and not so good a marriage. We pray, Lord, that whatever your word is to them tonight, that you would give them the ability to hear from you. And that as they hear from you, they would respond in making whatever adjustments they need through the Spirit. 
And we ask that we might leave here as people who have heard a word from Almighty God. For Jesus' sake, amen. When I was in the second year at Baptist Theological College in South Africa, um, and I was at that point still single, I, me- I remember going to one of our lecturers. He was our uh, church history lecturer, eventually became the principal of the college, to talk to him about the whole area of being single, not married. And uh, sitting down and having a conversation with him in his office about the fact that perhaps this is where my life was going to take me, end up being single the rest of my life and, and, and never getting married. And as we talked about it, I remember him turning to me at one point and saying, Ian, are you prepared, if it is God's will, God's purpose for you, to be single the rest of your life? Now, at one level... At a, at a kind of theological, almost disconnected level, of course, as a Christian, you want to be able to answer yes, don't you? Because you want to be able to say to the Lord, whatever you want, I'm happy to accept however that looks in the future. But at an emotional level, and at a personal level, there's a, a battle within where you have certain desires and certain hopes and certain dreams and expectations, and you hope that those two will somehow fall within, the, within God's will. And so at, a, at one level, I, I, I remember saying to him, it's something I need to wrestle through, um, because at a personal level, I, I would struggle with that. But at a theological level, at a spiritual level, I need to submit to the Lord. And so I went home and had to wrestle through that question. And it took a while, but finally I got to the point at which I was able to honestly say before God, even though the desire to get married was still there, was still present, it's not as if God removed the desire, but God brought me to a point of total submission of being able to say before God, however my life works its way out, if that includes marriage, and I hope it does, I hope that's the way it goes. But if it doesn't, Lord, if it means being single the rest of my life, then I'm happy to submit to that because if that's your purpose for me, then that's more important than simply having a desire fulfilled that is within me. And that took a while to get to that point. And I remember finally surrendering that part of my person to God. And I suspect there's some of you in a similar situation. I suspect we have some singles in the church who would love to be married. And you're hoping that sometime in the future, you are going to be married. And you're hoping that God will bring into your life a partner, a godly partner. And perhaps as you're getting a little bit older and it hasn't happened yet, you're beginning to wonder about that. I was 27 at the time, approaching my 28th birthday, and thinking to myself, what time is, is, is running out? And perhaps you're in that situation and wondering, is this ever going to happen? And perhaps it's an area of great turmoil for you. And you know what Paul wants to do? Paul wants to say to you, be free from that anxiety. Whatever it is that God purposes for you, allow God to work out those outcomes and find your contentment if it's in being single the rest of your life or if it's in being married. Find your contentment in that. Because, you know, as a pastor, I have had to deal with marriages that have gone wrong. And I want to tell you, single people, there are some marriages that people wish they weren't in. And sometimes in those kinds of marriages where people are married, you know, one of the things as a single you may be saying is, I just would love to have some companionship. Let me tell you, in some marriages, there's zero companionship. They may live together. They may be together. 
but there's no real companionship, and so that problem of singleness is not really resolved. And so there's a sense in which, as the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, he wants to deal with this issue in a in a sensitive, in a pastoral way. And so his pastoral heart keeps coming through. And basically, he has two messages. On the one hand, he says, if you married and you've got some anxiety surrounding your marriage because you're not sure you can be involved in as much in God's work as you would like to be, just let it go and don't worry about that. If you're unmarried and you're single, and that's the Satan, stop worrying about that. Be free from anxiety. Because it's not about whether you're married or not married. There is no command from God that one is better than the other. But there is contentment that comes from God in either situation. And that's what the Apostle Paul aims at. So firstly, I want you to notice the consideration of singleness Look at verses 25 to 28. Eat, uh, whoops, I'm on the wrong chapter. Verses 25 to 28. Now about virgins. Can we just pause there for a minute? Because what that sounds like is that sounds like Paul is talking to all unmarrieds, but he's not. That little word there in the original language, lucin, it, it, it means literally loose. It's, it's not talking about uh, virgin so much. It's an unusual word that he's using. But he's talking about those who are in a relationship where they are engaged. Now, in order for us to understand that, we need to understand the context of how engagement happened in a Jewish life. It's not like today, where when you get engaged, you go and buy a ring if you're a man, hopefully you do, and you find once you've got that ring, you go to the girl and you ask her to marry you, and if she says yes, you put the ring on her finger, and that's kind of your pledge that you're going to follow through with your commitment to get married. But, but engagements can break up very easily. There's no contract you've, you've entered into. There's no formal agreement you've signed. It's not legal. It's just an agreement verbally that you enter into to with the person, not so with the Jews. When you got betrothed, when you got engaged, there was a formal contractual basis in which you entered into that relationship. So that was the first part. It was a legal uh, uh, agreement you entered into. And as a result of that, that covenant you entered into was binding on you as a couple now. In other words, at that point, even though the consummation, even though you hadn't consummated the marriage in the sexual union of that marriage, you were considered married. And that was a very formalized engagement process. And the word that he uses here is the word of being loosed or getting out of a contract and all the external papyri that is around that day, that same word is used of getting out of a legal contractual obligation. So the Apostle Paul is writing to those who are engaged, entered into this contractual agreement, but now are receiving external pressure. And the pressure is coming from those who are against marriage. And coming from those who believe in this, this resurrection body they've already received as though they're living in, in the new state of uh, salvation, this new body that they've entered into now, and so believe that the whole thing of marriage is no more. And so these people are trying to influence those who are engaged and trying to say to them, you know, uh, s since there's no marriage in heaven, this legal marriage you've entered into with this person, you, you should get out because we're in the heavenly state. And so that's the pressure coming on these who are engaged. Let's keep going. Verse 25. Now, about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give one as judgment who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Now, if you can just pause there very briefly. I have no command from the Lord. This is not the Apostle Paul saying, this is not 
something that you, you should take to heart. I'm just giving my opinion, and, and you can, in a sense, take it or leave it because I have no command from the Lord. What he means by that is Jesus didn't give any command regarding this. There's nothing there that Jesus said about this particular thing. But because Paul is writing as one who has been inspired by the Spirit, everything he writes is God-breathed and superimposed by the Spirit. So that means it is trustworthy, and which is why he ends. Do you notice how he ends? That I too had the Spirit of God. In other words, I'm actually writing by the Spirit of God. It's not that I'm devoid of the Spirit of God, and it's a way of verifying what he's saying. But what he's doing here when he says there's, there, uh, you know, he, he, he's going to tell them what to do, is he's saying from a pastoral perspective, what I'm going to share with you is not a command. It's not an imperative. It's my pastoral heart. It comes out of the mercy of the Lord. And you can uh, accept it, and, and you can choose which side of the equation you're going to come down on. Verse 25. Relax, we're going to go a lot quicker. I give judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Remember that was the theme coming through, stay as you are? What present crisis? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. I'm not going to go through all of them. But he is talking about the pressure that Christians are experiencing as a result of persecution. Uh, there was severe persecution that was beginning to take hold uh, against those who uh, were Christians. And this persecution was going to be ramped up with Nero. So that when Nero comes to power, Christians would be bound in lion skins, for example. And they were then taken and thrown into the circus where the crowds had gathered to watch. And then lions were released, and these lions would come out and rip these Christians to pieces. Now, some of the parties that Nero engaged in, he would get Christians, and he would impale them on a, on a sharp post. And then he would pour oil over them, and he would light them, and he would use them as lamps for his parties as you walked in to where he was having his parties. So, so Paul's aware that persecution is going to be ramped up. And in view of this present crisis, he says, it is better to stay as you are. In other words, if you are single, stay single. Because if you get married, you're going to add another difficulty to your life. If these are the issues you're facing now, Marriage just adds an extra. Because of this present crisis, I think that it's good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want you to spare, spare you this. So here he's simply saying that uh, in view of the difficulties you face as a Christian uh, in the persecution, if you get married, you add an extra layer to that. What does he mean? Well, once you're married, there is a mutual concern you have for each other. And if you are in that situation now, not only are you concerned about your own life and the persecutions you might endure, but now you are concerned for your husband or wife and the persecutions they may endure. It's a dilemma that missionaries have, isn't it? Because when missionaries get called to go to remote places, and sometimes those remote places may include an element of danger, there's always this consideration, do we go or don't we go? And in making that kind of decision, if you're married, if you're single, it's easy because you just decide, look, I can go. I don't have to worry about a husband or wife. I can just go. And if I get killed, well, well, so be it. But if you're married, now you've got another consideration, haven't you? You've got to worry about 
your husband or wife and the kind of danger you might be exposing them to and the fact that they may get killed in that situation. And so Paul is simply highlighting that. He's simply saying, well, if you get married, the extra concerns now that you have to worry about, that if you were unmarried, you don't have to worry about. Those things don't come into play. So when he talks about the, the, the being single, the, 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 he's saying to those who are in their current situation, stay as you are. If you're single, don't become anxious about having to get married. If you marry, don't think about trying to get out of the marriage. Stay as you are. And then he adds a little layer to all of this by asking you to consider, secondly, your lifestyle, verses 29 to 35. Consideration of lifestyle. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Now, what does he mean by that? Is the Apostle Paul saying that he expects Christ to return immediately? And the answer, of course, is no. What he means when he says time is short, he means that with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, with his death and his resurrection, with his ascension into heaven, the last days have been inaugurated. In other words, the last part of history is now unfolding. We are living in the last days. That time period is now going to be short because Jesus Christ is going to come back and all of that has been put into motion. So in view of the fact that the time we now have is short, in that sense, in that Christ, uh, God's timetable is being enacted about the coming of Christ, the last days are being ushered in, he goes on to say, in view uh, of this short time, from now on, those who have wives should live as though they had none. Those who mourn, he gives five illustrations now, those uh, who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if they're not theirs to keep, those who use things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. So he gives five illustrations. Now it's not necessary to go into the details of all of those illustrations, they're self-evident. But the overall point that he's making is this. Because we are now living in the last times, don't allow your focus to become so caught up in the things of the world that you lose sight of the world to come. In other words, the Apostle Paul is trying to remind us that this world is temporary. This world is passing away. And so the whole aspect of crying or mourning or being happy or buying or selling, all of those kinds of activities one day are going to be gone. They are temporary. They're not going to last forever. And that includes marriage. There's no marriage in heaven. And so all of these things that we are presently engaged in, well, they're not permanent. So don't get so caught up and so involved in these things that you lose sight of heaven to which you are ultimately moving. Let heaven drive you, in other words. There are so many distractions in the world, the Apostle Paul says, that it's easy for us to get laid aside and distracted and taken down paths that are not helpful for us. And it's very easy for us to get so caught up in worldliness and not necessarily in the bad sense of worldliness, but in the things of the world that we forget about our eternal destiny. Isn't that true? Let me ask you, how often... During the day, do you think about heaven? And so he wants us to get our focus right. He wants Christians, married or single, not to live with anxiety in this world because of their status. So let me read on. I would like you to be free from concern. Do you hear that? This is his pastoral heart coming through. Why don't you be anxious? An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is 
concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. Now, what Paul is not saying there, because it's very often been misinterpreted, he's not saying that those who are unmarried are at a better status level than the married because the unmarried don't have the same distractions as the married, so they are in a better position in terms of being able to serve the Lord. In fact, the Paul is saying exactly the opposite. What Paul is trying to say is if you're unmarried, yes, you can devote all of your time to serving the Lord, but if you're married, you've got concerns concerning your husband or wife. Don't become anxious about the fact that your time is going to be divided differently to those who are single. Don't allow the anxiety of trying to balance out how much you serve God and how much you care for your husband or wife, and that means that you can't serve to the same extent of those who are single and don't have those worries, don't let that overwhelm you. It doesn't really matter. Yes, as a married person, your time is going to be divided, but don't become anxious. Don't look at the single person and don't think, you know, I wish I could be serving God as much as that single person was. I just can't be involved in the affairs of God as much as I would like because I've got other concerns about being married and at home. Doesn't that make sense? The Apostle Paul is saying, don't get anxious about it. Don't worry about it. Don't let people put pressure on you. Don't let it make you feel guilty that somehow, because your time is, is used differently, that, that, that you aren't serving God to the extent at which you could be serving God. You serve God according to how you are able to serve Him, according to the time that you do have available. And you dedicate to him what you're able to dedicate to him. And don't allow your time to be so dedicated to the Lord that your family suffers if you're married. That's equally bad. Don't become anxious when you think, you know, I'd love to be serving in this area, but that means that my family are going to suffer, so I can't serve in this area, and start feeling guilty about it. Paul says, you shouldn't be anxious about that. And thus... He says, but a married man is concerned about the affairs. And then he goes on, I've read that, verse 34. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Now he turns to, of course, the same one, those who are engaged. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. That's simply a way of saying that the unmarried uh, uh, woman who is engaged at this particular point in time, her her overall devotion is to her whole self to being devoted to Lord. Body and spirit is simply a way of saying the whole person is involved, the whole aspect of her at that point before she enters into the consummation of the marriage is devoted to the Lord. That will change, of course, once the, the marriage is consummated. And then he says, then he turns his attention to the married. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of the world how she can please her husband. So it's the same thing now just talking about how the wife is trying to divide up her time and the anxiety she may experience for the same reason that the husband may experience those anxieties. Paul saying, let it go. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Hear that. So the apostle is saying now that those who are married can be just as devoted to the Lord as those who are single, even though their service of God is going to be less than those who are single. Isn't that encouraging? Because it's very easy to have this almost kind of view where those who are engaged in, in all kinds of areas of service are, are somehow going to get more brownie points because of their service than those who are less able to serve because of their concern for their families. And Paul's saying, no, 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 that's not true. That's wrong. Your devotion to the Lord is not contingent upon whether or not you're married or whether you're unmarried. Now, to, to be sure, what the Apostle Paul is, is also not dealing with here, is not raising here, is there may be a situation where a single or married is not devoted to the Lord at all completely uninvolved. That's another issue, and he doesn't raise it here, so we won't go there. He continues. Verse 35. 
I'm saying this for your own good. So we've covered that, your devotion to the Lord. So overall then, don't be anxious about your singleness or your married status. Continue to serve the Lord as he enables and empowers you. Neither one is better or worse. They're just different. Then thirdly, I want you to notice the consideration of marriage, verses 36 to 40. If anyone thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if she is getting along in years and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. The ESV actually translates this little, a little better than the NRV. He addresses the man in an engaged relationship. And what he's saying to that particular man who is betrothed, who has entered into a legal contract with a woman, is he's saying if your sexual passions begin to overwhelm you and begin to increase and you're putting off marriage because of the pressure that is coming externally from the ascetics who are saying, well, you know, there is really no marriage and you really should be putting it off and you really shouldn't get married and you're feeling this external pressure not to get married. He says you need to get married. And if the person you're engaged to is getting older and there are issues related with her getting older and she's becoming anxious about whether this is just going to continue on indefinitely, Paul says, don't do that for the sake of your person you're engaged in and for your own sake, go through with the marriage. Get on with it. Don't put it off forever. He continues, he is not sinning, they should get married, but the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man does the right thing. So Paul is saying, they're both situations, if you are in that situation and you don't want to get married... For whatever reason it may be, maybe there's something that's come up, maybe there's something that has, has caused you to, to have a change of mind, then you also are not under compulsion to have to get married. So then he who marries the virgin does the right thing, but he who does not marry her does even better. Now the reason he says does better is because Paul at this point is celibate. And at this point, he is not married. And as a result of that, he recognizes that his ability to serve Lord, the Lord has been greater than those who are married, and his concerns are less than those who are married. And so he's saying to the man who is not married, you know, I think it's better that you, you remain unmarried. But at the end of the day, it's not whether you get married or, 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 or don't get married. You choose. You make the choice. There's no pressure on you Either way. And then look at verse 39. This verse is often not dealt with because it's a difficult one in terms of today. A woman is bound to a husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. Here Paul is saying that if you are in a marriage relationship, you are bound for life. And the only thing that ends that marriage relationship, the only thing, is death. Now you might get divorced in this world, but getting divorced in this world doesn't mean in God's sight you're divorced. Because ultimately a marriage is cemented in heaven. And I know there are all kinds of arguments that are brought into the equation. I've heard them all. So there's some who say, but, but Ian, if you got married before you were converted, before you became a Christian, and now subsequently you become a Christian, and the person who, who you married, he wants to divorce you, and you've given them freedom to divorce, and they divorce you, and they walk out, uh, you know, uh, isn't your status now different? Aren't you free to remarry? Because when you got married, you weren't, re you weren't saved, and so the marriage was done under a different kind of system. 
Well, let's use a different illustration to try and highlight. Does that mean that if a rapist has raped someone before, while they were a non-Christian, and now that they've become a Christian, that they should be released from jail? There are consequences. Marriage is not about a marriage only counts if you're a Christian in God's sight. Marriage is marriage whether you're a Christian or not a Christian in God's sight. And the binding is the covenant and consummation that bring you together. And once that has occurred and there has been that commitment and that consummation, only death ends it. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, divorce doesn't feature in, in God's world. And I know we get to Matthew 19, everyone raises Matthew 19. And everyone says, oh, but, but, but what about verses 1 to 10? Because do, doesn't Jesus say that you, you have a get out of jail free clause if there's been adultery committed? Doesn't that mean if there's been marital unfaithfulness, well, that releases you from marriage and, and then you can get remarried so that those who have marital unfaithfulness committed against them now allows them and gives them the chance to get remarried because they're no longer bound. But it's, isn't it interesting because there's a contradiction there. At one level, what people say is, well, the innocent party is free to remarry, but the guilty party is not. You, know, you can't have it both ways. Either both are free to remarry because the bond is broken or both are not. When Jesus deals with Matthew 19, he deals with the engagement situation, those who are betrothed, those who have entered into a covenant already, but haven't consummated the marriage yet. And so he says to them, where you discover in that engagement period, where you discover there's been marital unfaithfulness, where one of the partners has gone and had a sexual relationship with someone else, you are free to divorce them because they had to go through a formalized divorce process in that engagement uh, situation with Jews because it was a legal transaction they had entered into. Under those circumstances, he says, there you can get out. And you are not obligated and you can remarry or you can get engaged again and you can go through marriage. That's why the disciples, when he gets to the end of that section, say, if that's the case, it's better not to get married. Why would they say that? If Jesus is saying, as did the, one of the schools of the Pharisees, the um, Shalal, uh, a school of the Pharisees who would say uh, the only reason for divorce and remarriage is unfaithfulness. If Jesus is agreeing with them, then why would the disciples be surprised? Why would they say it's better not to get remarried? It's better not to marry at all. There's just no logical reason. If, if Jesus is agreeing with the, the school of uh, the, the Shammai, then, then what he's saying is nothing new. And the disciples say, oh, okay, well, if, if, if that's the case, then marital unfaithfulness is the only reason. No, they say it's better not to get married. And then Jesus says, well, for some, uh, they won't get married because they choose not to and so on. No, no, Jesus is up the ante. He's taken it from here to here. And he's taken it back to God's original purpose. When the two become one. And that bond they enter into is for life. And the only thing that breaks that bond is death. And then the person is free to remarry. That's why when I do premarital counseling, I sit down with the couples. I said this last week and I say to them, you get one shot at this. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because don't enter into this marriage if you're unsure. If there's some nagging doubts you have, deal with it now. Because if you get married and those doubts continue and those issues get bigger and bigger and bigger, you're bound. But we don't function like that, do we? Marriage and divorce is rife and remarriage. But not in God's world. 
And so it becomes fundamentally important that if you're single, you choose very, very wisely. Don't get yourself into a marriage that 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, you want to get out of because you never went into it carefully enough. Because the binding is done in heaven, not on earth. That's why when we do a marriage in church, what do we say? Before God and this people. Now, I'm not saying that to be harsh. This is what God's word says. You are bound until death. It's straightforward. There's no ambiguity. It's very easy. So make sure, young people who are not married, that you think very, very carefully about who you do marry one day. And if you are married, and you discover there is marital infidelity, and that person walks out of your marriage, you are still bound. And until that person dies, you are still bound. Now, there are others who disagree, so I must say that. There are others who say, no, 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 that's not what it means. And you need to wrestle through this issue yourself and come to your own conclusions but I think it's the most consistent way of understanding Matthew 19 combined with 1 Corinthians 7. When you put those two passages together in Mark chapter 5, that Jesus talks about divorce, and you understand the context in which they come and the audience to which they are being addressed, I think this is the most consistent approach of Scripture. But there are others who have different views. And so when I deal with people who have been divorced and ask can they get remarried, I go through this with them and I give them a book to read. It gives you four views of marriage and divorce and ask them to draw their own conclusions. But my understanding of Scripture is that marriage is for life, bound in heaven. So enter in wisely. And if you're single here and you remain single the rest of your life, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not inferior to the married your status is no different to theirs. And you can find contentment in that state because your contentment is in Christ, not in your marital status. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to take it to heart. And for those who are single here this evening, Lord, as difficult as it may be, as much as they want to get married, as much as they may desire to have a lifelong partner, Lord, I don't know what your will is for their lives. I pray that you would give them the ability to wrestle this issue through with you and that you would unveil your purposes for them and that whatever those purposes are in the future, however difficult they, they may be to have to accept, give them the willingness to submit to you willingness to accept whatever you have in store for them and to find contentment in you. I pray, Lord, because you have said it's not good for man to be alone, that you would enable all our single people who want to get married to find someone that they could get married to, a godly partner. I pray that you would bring people into their lives that they could enjoy a lifelong companionship with. But if you choose not to, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them by your grace and that even in the midst of perhaps their tears and disappointment, you would minister to them and help them to find satisfaction in you. And for those who are married, Lord, who perhaps are not in a great marriage, enable them to draw strength from you. Enable them to trust you. Enable them to find ways in which they are able to minister to their partner, even if their partner doesn't accept that ministry. And help them to find contentment in you too not to seek to get out of it. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. And I pray too, Lord, for those who are divorced or going through a divorce, who are in the situation where a husband or wife has walked out on them, never to return. I pray for them, Lord. Pray that you would minister to their great need, that you would help them too to find contentment in you, even if they are the innocent party. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be their companion, 
that you would come alongside them, that you would be near to them, that you would fulfill the needs they have. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to sing a final song. So why don't you join standing as we